Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. And 2 Timothy chapter number 1, we're going to use verses 11 and 12 as our reading for this morning. So 2 Timothy 1, verses 11 and 12. If you have it, say amen. amen. Let's read. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have been unto him against that day. Amen. Now, this morning we're going to begin our, our sixth lesson in the book of 2 Timothy. Last time when we were in this book, we were looking at the issue of where Paul was talking about how an individual should not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ or of the message of the gospel of the grace of God. And we looked at you know, how it is that the world tries to make an individual ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. How you know, tries to make a person you know, feel like, well, I shouldn't even start bringing up things that are related to the Bible or things related to the Lord Jesus Christ. How even when you get into the side of the circles of talking about Christianity, that, well, we don't really talk about doctrine. We just you know, kind of out fellowship together and love each other. We don't talk about the real doctrinal issues. And if we do... You know, you know, you guys are all nuts out there to believe in that idea of right division. You know, because you know, look at you in numbers wise, and look at, you know, and I'll pick on a group here, a church like the Chapel, uh, you know, out in uh, the Williamsville area that has hundreds or thousands of people attending it. You know, well. Just based on numbers, they have to be right. You guys are wrong. You know, and trying to make the issue of that, you know, because there's so few individuals who are understanding these things, that you should be ashamed of what you believe. And what Paul's going to start doing here, these verses we're looking at today, and what we're actually going to cover next week, is start talking to Timothy here, who is get, writing this epistle of encouragement to, and to us, who are reading this to say, this is what you need to do in order to not feel that shame that the world wants you to feel. And when he starts here in our passage here in verse 11, He's, he has to go back and talk about himself again and talk about who he is when he says, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And that's who the apostle Paul is. He's a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And we see, well, I want to go back into 1 Timothy for a moment. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. And we see that Paul's going to talk about this here as well. And we're going to pick up in verse 5 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. And 
as he's laying it, he takes it back to <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's always where everything has to start. It's with the Lord Jesus Christ and what He accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary. Amen. It has nothing to do with you know, myself or Pastor Reed or Brother Rondell coming up here and just you know, with you know, our wisdom coming up here and speaking what we think or what we feel. We're coming up here and using the Word of God and talking about what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for us. How He went to the cross, took our sin upon Himself so that we could receive His righteousness. So that we could receive the gift of eternal life. So that we could have forgiveness of sin as a present possession. You know, not have to worry about, you know, think of, well, okay, I'm forgiven today, but what happens tomorrow? And what happens, you know, at one o'clock today when I mess up? We've been given a complete victory because the sin issue is completely taken care of and that's such a glorious thing to think about and when we think about things like that and brother Rondell was talking about how excited he gets when he thinks that's how we should be and, and if we have that, I can guarantee you that you're not going to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ or identifying yourself as being a Christian because you have that understanding of what's been done. You have that, you know, and when you have that in you, you're going to have the desire to want to go out and share what he did yeah. and go talk with others and try to get them to be in that same place where you are Amen. and Paul you know, when you look at who Paul is you see the purpose that he had well, go to Acts chapter number 9 We're going here in Acts 9. It's just going to be you know, shortly after the salvation of Paul. And I want to read here this verse to the conversation between Ananias and God when Ananias is having a fear of having a conversation with Saul of Tarsus based on everything that he knew of him. But in Acts chapter 9, I'll read verse 15. It says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And Paul had a purpose that's laid out right here to bear his name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. In Acts chapter 26, you see how it talks about that he was to talk about the things which he had seen and the things which were going to appear unto him. And so Paul's given this ministry, a ministry that he later on expands upon to explain what he sees his purpose is. We'll go to Ephesians chapter number 3. Yeah. 
And here in Ephesians chapter number 3, we're going to start at verse number 7. It says, whereof, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And here Paul is talking about a piece of information, and, and he identifies it as the fellowship of the mystery. And when he's talking about, he says that it was kept and I want to actually, before I paraphrase the verse too badly, <laughs> which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. So all the way back here, the information that's given to the Apostle Paul was hid in God. And as you go forward here, it's, it's hidden it's hidden, it's hidden, and also now it's revealed. Now the information that the Apostle Paul is given has been revealed because the message for the Gentiles, the dispensation of grace, now it has been revealed. And one of the things we were talking about you know, during our Sunday school this morning is we talked about how there's 66 books of the Bible. You know, out of those 66 books, only 13 of them contain the information for today. Romans through Philemon. And we talked about how individuals spend so much time Studying things that are back here that are related to the nation of Israel, are related to an earthly kingdom that's going to be established. And when you read through things like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see things of you, know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, you know, when he's sending out the apostles, he sends them only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's not sending them, okay, go out and everyone you find, preach this message to. He says, well, if you see these people, don't give it to them. Don't talk to these people. Find the lost sheep of the house of Israel and give them this message. When we look at here, we see Paul, what we just read in verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. When we're here in the dispensation of the grace of God, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. There's only all of mankind that God is dealing with. <coughs> and Paul sees his purpose is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now if he's going to make you know, all men see, can he be ashamed of what his message is? No. Now what's interesting is Paul does pray for something or in the book of Ephesians. He prays for boldness to be able to go out and say, you know what? I know I got to preach this message. I need the boldness to be able to go out and do this. Because the reality is, is not all of us can just walk up to someone and just start talking to them. You know, some people are, oh, I, I could never do that. You know, I could never just 
you know, I have to get to know the person first before I can carry on. You know, other people can just, you know, you, you set them loose in the gallery of mall and say, uh, you know, go, go talk to as many people as you can. You know, some people come here, I didn't. You know, I, I was there for three hours, I didn't talk to anybody. You know, other people go, I was there for three hours, and you know, I, I tried to share the gospel with you know, a couple hundred people during those three hours. But the issue is, you pray for that spirit of boldness to be able to share that gospel, to be able to teach those things, because Paul wants all men to see. God's will would be that all men would be saved. Now, that doesn't mean that all men are going to be saved. Because men have a free will. Men can choose to, you know, the gospel's presented to them. They can either accept it or they can reject it. And if they reject it, that's their decision. But God would have all men to be saved. Okay. Let's go back to 2 Timothy. Well, I want to go to chapter 4 for a second before we go back to our text. Because even as Paul is closing out this epistle, is going to come back to this issue about the Gentiles hearing here in verse 17 of chapter 4. Where it says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the line. Now, we'll, when we can finally get to chapter 4, we'll talk more about that verse in detail. I want to think that Paul, so as he's closing this, is still talking about how that all the Gentiles might hear. That they might all have access. They might all you know, become saved by receiving this message. Now Paul knows that, okay, there's some things that are going to happen. And when, back in our text here, when we look at verse 12, you know, he's identifying, he says, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Now, Paul realizes that by teaching this message, it's not going to be all sunshine and lollipops and rainbows. There's going to be some problems that are going to come from preaching the word of God rightly divided. Paul's life is filled with all of those problems. I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 because he's going to list out some of those things. This is one of these passages when you read it, you almost get tired just reading it when you see all of the things that Paul went through by the time he's writing this epistle. His ministry still continues on after this. But when he says this here, 2 Corinthians 11, we'll start at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, 
that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now, you read that list, and you see all of the things that Paul suffered. And knowing that there was more to come, It would have been very easy to kind of want, you know, boy, this is getting really tough. Mm. You know, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And there were individuals that ministered with Paul that stopped ministering with him because these things were happening. I said, you know, I... This is getting too dangerous. I'm going to try to blend in with everyone else. I don't want to have to deal with these things. And when we were back in Acts chapter 9, we didn't read the verse, but verse 16 of chapter 9 talks about how you know, God said that he was given this message to go and preach to those individuals. And the very next thing talks about how he's going to suffer for his sake. That the suffering was going to be tied in with teaching this message. Paul, as he's writing the epistle we're studying, is sitting in a prison cell, waiting to die. And he's writing this epistle. And trying to encourage Timothy to don't be ashamed of what this message is. Because Paul understood that he was going to have to suffer and that not only was he going to have to suffer, but anyone who teaches this message is going to. I'll go to Philippians chapter number 1. Here in Philippians chapter number 1, we we'll read here verse number 29. It says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. As part of the fact that we're members of the body of Christ, suffering is going to come. Paul, in 2 Timothy, is also going to talk about how all those who live godly are going to face persecution. Now, how is it that a person lives godly? I actually talked about that a few weeks ago, of how a person lives godly by the doctrine living out of them. When we apply the doctrine of Romans through Philemon to our lives, and we allow it to work through us, we are living godly. And I'll say, if you're living godly, this is going to come. You're going to have to face these things. We'll go to 1 Thessalonians for a moment. And we'll go to chapter number 3. I'm going to start right at verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereon too. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sensed to know your fame, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, 
and our labor be in vain. And here as he's writing to the church of Thessalonica, he's identifying the fact that you know, you, you know that we're appointed to these afflictions. You know, I have told you we we're going to suffer tribulation. And it's come to pass. And yet, you know, what he says here in verse 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you. Now, the temptation is, if we're talking about afflictions, if we're talking about tribulation, the temptation would be to say, Jack, I know that you know, you've been suffering these things. And I'm going to tell you how you can avoid suffering those things. You sit there and you talk about all those things related to right division. Put all that aside. Just take all of God, all the promises that the Bible contains, apply everything to your life, and that's all going to go away. Now, hopefully when someone says that to Jack, you know, he doesn't fall for that. <laughs> and he's able to show that, you know, no, there's a reason why we study the Word of God rightly divided. But the temptation is going to be Here's a way out. Here's a way that you're not going to have to face these things. Even though the Word of God is saying you're going to have to face them. Now, the Word of God, not only does it tell you that you're going to have to face them, the Word of God also gives you the answer on how to get through those things. And that's the thing of what, you know, when we talk about not being ashamed, and when we're talking about the issue of suffering, that's what we have to, that the Word of God is going to give the answer we need. Now, the first part of this, we'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And this is passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is one that sometimes when people first hear it, they say, well, it can't be just that easy of what the verse says. And when the verse says here in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And so, well, you know, let's talk about the small problems of life. You know, like those books that are out there, don't sweat the small stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not talking about my problem. Because my problem isn't a light affliction. Mm -hmm. you know, my problem is, you know, it says it's but for a moment. You don't know how long I've been dealing with this. But God is saying, whatever it is, it's a light affliction. Whatever it is, it's but for a moment. Now, to put in perspective here, if somebody is dealing with cancer, and say that they've been you know, fighting cancer for years. And say, so, well, see, you know, your problem only lasted a, a month. You know, I've been battling this for years. Well, what's the span of, I'll even say, 20 years? What's the span of 20 years when you compare it with all of eternity? 20 years. It's just a blink of an eye when you can compare it with all of eternity. 
And that's why God can say, you know what? It's but for a moment. And what you're going through, there's a purpose behind it because it's working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And the reason why it does that, let's read the next verse here, verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, the things that are going on right now, it's temporary. It's going to pass whatever it is. But the glory that comes, that's eternal. That's why Paul can talk about it. I didn't want to read the passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2 because we're going to, we'll get there eventually where it talks about how if we suffer, we're going to reign with him. And he equates those two things. And that also takes it, if we deny him, he'll deny us. And he's not <coughs> talking about our salvation there. Because when we're saved, we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we have a guarantee of our salvation. So it can't be denying us our salvation. The only thing he can be denying us is, well, if we're denying the suffering, he's going to deny the ability to reign. Because we're denying him. We're not allowing the things to work, as it says here, to work that more exceeding and eternal way of glory. Now, in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, Paul says that God is the God of all comfort. It's not, well, okay, well, some things you can get comfort from, from God, and other things you're going to have to get comfort from, from this over here. He's the God of all comfort. Our comfort starts with the Word of God. It comes from what He can do for us. When we look at what He says to Paul, I want to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. We're starting verse 7. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. We'll stop there for a second. So something happens to Paul that he's identifying and saying, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. And this is going on, and three times, Paul's going to ask, Lord, take this away from me. Now, we're going to see what God's answer is going to be to this. You know, and it's not going to be, you know what, Paul? <sighs> Let me just take that away from you. The answer in verse 9 is, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, and reproaches, and necessities, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And here we think that God's grace is sufficient. 
And it's sufficient because I want to focus at the end of verse 10 here when it says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. And when Paul's weak, who is he how is he able to be strong? He's, be, you know, he's able to be strong through Christ. Mm -hmm. That's how he can say, then am I strong. Because it's not him. It's you know, what Galatians 2.20 is talking about, that Christ living through him. Mm -hmm. It's what he can talk about. And when I go to Philippians chapter number 4, Because this verse is really going to say how Paul can say that he is strong at that point. When in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's how Paul can say that he's strong. It's because he can do all things, not of himself, mm -hmm. but he can do all things through mm -hmm. Christ. And, it, and doing it through Christ allows him to be able to say, I'm strong, because it's Christ who's the strength. It's Christ who's doing those things. It's Christ who's getting him through those things. And allowing him to be in a position where he can say, you know, I'm suffering all these things. And when we go back to our text, he says, you know, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I know I'm going through all these things, but yet it's not making me ashamed. And it's not making me ashamed because we, what he says here in our text, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And he takes it back to the one he says, I know whom I have believed. And takes it back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Takes it back to an understanding that he has. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And here we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to start here, verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is who he's with. That the old things have passed away and all things have become new. And all of that occurs because he put his trust in what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Amen. He put his trust in the gospel that says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And his belief in that and that alone for salvation is what allows him to be able to say that we have you know, though we have known Christ after the flesh, now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You're in Christ the moment <coughs> you put your trust in the gospel. Amen. And it's not a work. Amen. In the book of Romans, it shows how that belief is not It's Faith only that gives us this issue. It gives us our salvation. And when we have our salvation, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1. 
Because this verse is going to show how the distinction between when we talk about the things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that are focused on the kingdom that's going to be established here upon the earth. And here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Our blessings have nothing to do with this. Amen. It's all geared at the heavenly places. That's where our blessings are. You know, and the blessings that are laid out, and here's the difference between when we talk about the gospel of the kingdom, the blessings that they had, they were things that you could actually see. I could see that, okay, you know, everything's going well in your life, so obviously you're doing the right things. Oh, that happened to you? Okay, what? All right, what did you do? Why did you end up with that happening to you? Because you know, the blessing was taken away from you. When you look at the issue of spiritual blessings in heavenly places, there are things that we can't see. We can't feel them. But yet, we know that they're true. Amen. We know that we have all those things because the Word of God is telling us that we have those blessings. And it will tell us that we have them. When we read our verse, it says, Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? That's past tense. When we put our trust in the gospel, we already received those blessings the moment we did that. We don't have to wait for it. Now, we have to wait for, when we talk about the justification, the sanctification in our glorification, we, you know, when our glorification comes, you know, we're then going to see those things. But we know it's a reality. Absolutely. We know that we're seated with Christ in mm -hmm. heavenly places. Mm -hmm. But you're all sitting in, in chairs in the George K. Arthur Community Center. Mm -hmm. How can you say you're seated in heavenly places? Well, because the Word of God tells me mm -hmm. that I'm seated in heavenly places. I know that that's the reality of things. <clears throat> Those are the things that Paul can say, you know, I know who I've believed. And then he says that, you know, you know, and there's something there by knowing who I believe that he's persuaded by some things. And he's persuaded by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that's going to do these things. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want to read this verse here because individuals say, well, what Paul wrote isn't the Word of God. He's talking about you know, things that he came up with on his own. But Paul says here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the Word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you, that believe. <clears throat> Paul went there. Paul preached to them. And they accepted what was being said as being the word of God. And allowed them to work in them. That's what's going to 
persuade someone is the word of God. It's what when <coughs> when you get two texts, when you get <coughs> Colossians chapter three and Ephesians chapter number five. When we look at Ephesians 5 first, it says, verse 18, where we're going to start, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And here we have Paul talking about what the believer is supposed to do, and he says, he's instructed to be filled with the Spirit. Now, many times when people hear this, what they picture is the preacher coming up, putting their hand on someone, and put and causing them to be filled with the Spirit. And then when you know he, he's filled with the Spirit, all of a sudden. The signs are going to come out of him because the Spirit is now fi filling him up and allowing him to do all these things. Hallelujah! <laughs> <laughs> now, I want you to keep in mind everything that we just read. And let's go over to Colossians chapter number 3. Now we're going to see Paul's going to say something that's going to sound awfully similar to what we just read, except he's going to change one thing in here. Verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Does that sound like what he was just telling the church at Ephesus to be doing? Except for one difference. It tells the church at Ephesus to be filled with the Spirit. It tells the church at Colossus, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So if he's telling, if he's saying that, Being filled with the Spirit means you're to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right. Yeah. That is what's going to be. You know, it's not some supernatural you know, laying on of hands that the Spirit's going to come upon someone. It's the Word dwelling in you. The Word is going to, the Word persuades someone. But Paul can write in the book of Romans, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God producing faith in an individual's life. The word of God making the change in a person's life. So that way, when you say, I'm persuaded, it's by what the word of God says. You know, that's why I think you won't hear me say it, and we'll hear Pastor Reed say it, of, you know, don't trust what we're saying. Take what we're saying and compare it with what the Bible yeah. says. And it doesn't matter who it is that's speaking. It should be, does it line up with the Word of God? You know, because people are going to be right, and people are going to be wrong because we're fallible human beings. But yet the Word of God is truth. That's why it's the Word of God that's always going to be the source of things. And when he's saying, you know, I'm persuaded, it's by what the Word of God 
says, and then he can continue on in our text and say that he's persuaded, he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So there's an issue of that some things have been committed unto him and that he's going to keep those things against a certain time. Now, we've already talked about how we're sealed. So we understand that. But I want to go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Because here Paul's going to talk about you know, the time frame of when that seal is going to last until. So you know, this is going to show that you know, why we can say we have a guarantee of our salvation. Because in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The seal of the Spirit, you know, that we've been sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, that seal is going to last until the day of redemption. So there's nothing we can do that's going to break that seal prior to that. This is why Paul can say in Philippians chapter number 1, well, let's go to Philippians 1, And when I read here in Philippians 1, we read verse 6. It says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's a good work that's been begun, and how and it's going to be performed until when? The day of Jesus Christ. Now it's going to take us back to what we've just been. You know, we're sealed un until the day of redemption. Now there's a good work that's performed until the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 10 of Philippians 1. That ye may, be a, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now we're sincere and without offense until that time frame. I'm just going to quickly read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, which says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul is saying we're blameless at this time. The Word of God has persuaded these things that when He can say here in our text that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who is doing those things. Amen. Why are we blameless? It's not because of us. We're blameless because when God looks at us, who does He see? He sees the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we can be blameless. That's how we can be sincere without offense. Because you know, if He looked at us, you know, do we make mistakes? Yeah, we do. So if He looked at us, He couldn't say we're without offense. He couldn't say we were blameless. Can he say that about the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Yes. Paul put his trust in what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He put it, we used his commitment there and knows that it's being kept until something occurs. The day of redemption. All these things that he's been making a reference to in there. And Paul 
knows and understands about the end of this dispensation. The event that we call the rapture in First Thessalonians. And even though that word's not in the Bible, we call it you know, the catching out of the saints is what the Bible actually describes that as. Of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back for His church. That's the day of redemption. And we're kept until then. And it's why he, when Paul in 2 Timothy is talking about... Let's go over to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. Because in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, when Paul is talking about the last days, he's talking about the time coming up to that day of redemption. Because the day of redemption is going to be what he's going to make a reference to in chapter 4. When he says the last days, he's not talking about the time frame known as the day of the Lord, saying, okay, you know, you as members of the body of Christ are going to be going through the day of the Lord. Amen. He's talking about the last days of the time leading up to that day of redemption that's going to occur. And so when Paul's saying, you know, I know, I'm persuaded that he's going to be able to keep me until that time. That's a thing that should make us feel that we're not ashamed. Because we know that every promise that has been given to us as members of the body of Christ, it's going to be fulfilled. We're going to see that day of redemption. We have our salvation. Now, next week, we're going to talk about some things about a little bit more about the Word of God and how that is going to keep us where we need to be during this life. Having said, I'm open up the floor for questions and comments.